there's always a space between what the government can provide and the private sector can produce that the non-governmental sector has to try to occupy. And that's more important than ever before. We had a million foundations in America before the financial downturn, and half of them were established in the last 12 years. Stunning. India has more than a million foundations active in India, about half of them domestic. China has probably 400,000 registered or not registered. Even Russia, where they've received the cold shoulder, has got a couple hundred thousand. So this non-governmental movement, the things Bono talked about, these things are important. And when you look at the inequalities, just take the inequalities within Rio. If you look at the problems in the aftermath of this Greek crisis, if you look at the challenges our friends in Spain are having because of the impact of the financial bubble there, there's plenty for people to do in the non-governmental sector there. So that's the one point I want to make. We all have something to do to sustain this at Lions Alliance because it's pivotal to building up to positive and reducing the negative forces of any economy. The second point I want to make is if you believe what I said, if you believe we're interdependent and you think that the roadblocks to a more positive life are inequality, instability, and unsustainability, then it requires us to think about the way we do our business differently. Uh, I tried to get a good relationship with Russia. I did everything I could to help them financially in my first year as president. But that was popular compared to Mexico. When I helped Russia, only 76% of the people were against that. But why did I do that? Because I knew we were going to share the future with them one or the other. And I knew they had been a great country before, and they would be again. And it hurts to get when whatever you're doing doesn't work anymore. Even if it's good for the world, it hurts. And I didn't want them to define their greatness. Ask the president of Georgia here. I did not want them to define their greatness in 19th century imperial terms. I wanted them to define their greatness in more positive terms. You know, every year, lots and lots of universities enter a global contest with team-solving computing problems. Really advanced. Last year, two of the top three finishers in the contest were universities in Russia, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. The other was Chinese. Our highest finisher was the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, where the Russian high scholars go. But the point is, I'd like for them to take a lot of pride in that and define their greatness that way, not whether they're fighting with Georgia or anybody else. Most people see geopolitics as a zero-sum game. Has to be a winner and a loser. And we Americans do really like those zero-sum games. And we're, we're in the pro basketball playoffs now. You watch these things. If they tie, we'll make them play all night long until there's a winner and a loser. If every third player breaks a leg, we'll still make them keep playing. And we do it in football, and we do it in soccer until we have a kickoff. We hate tied games. We hate games where both sides win. But we need to get used to games where both sides win in real life. As a matter of fact, it needs to be our operating principle that we can find a way for everyone to win. I'm now trying to help the Haitians rebuild their, their uh, country after that horrible earthquake and four horrible hurricanes in 2008. And one of the things that I'm doing my best to do, I had a long meeting with the Prime Minister today, is to try to help build an ethic by every single thing we do so that there will be a, a set of values that wants everybody to come out of this ahead and wants everyone to be better off, that we don't 
that we don't have to beat somebody down to lift somebody else up. And if you, if you think about what the Atlantic community went through in the 20th century, from World War I to the Great Depression to World War II to the Balkan War, if you think about the courage it took to unify Germany, for Germany to reach out to Russia, for the European Union to reach out to Russia, to take a chance on the Euro, to have a European Central Bank, to deal with all these political integration issues. Really, the Atlantic community, including our southern neighbors, ought to take the lead in building a world where we can increase the positive and boost the negative forces of independence. And we can do it because none of us have to win at someone else's expense. The best example of this on earth that I have encountered was in Rwanda, where I do a lot of work. They're the most amazing people I ever saw. And I went there after I was president the first time, and I was working on setting up their AIDS program for them. A reporter from America went there and said, uh, aren't you mad that Bill Clinton's here working? I mean, he said himself that he should have acted in 1994 to try to stop your genocide. It's one of his great regrets. And the cab driver said, no, I'm glad he's here. And he said, how can you say that? I mean, the guy was really frustrated because he was supposed to write a bad story. And <laughs> but the cab driver said, didn't have anything to do with me. It was about what was in his head. The cab driver said, he said, first, he did not make us kill each other. We did that all by ourselves. And second, at least he came here and apologized. No one else has. And right now, we're looking at the future, and we need all the help we can get. In other words, this guy did not have a zero-sum ethic. When I helped them personally and with my foundation to finish their genocide memorial, which was the most amazing three-tiered crypt with the bones of 300,000 victims of the genocide buried and registered on a roll of honor. And I went back to see it. I got this tour from this really handsome young man who was just calmly taking me through and going through, just like, you know, he was giving me a tour of the Museum of Natural History or something. And I said, do you lose anybody in the genocide? He said, oh, yes. He said, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister-in-law. And he said, well, if you stop at my uncles, my aunts, and my first cousins, 73 people. And I said, isn't this hard for you? He said, oh, no, it's therapeutic, my son. He said, we have to face the past so we can let go of it and get on with the future. So I said, you know, the first time Hillary and I came here in 98, I met with six genocide survivors, and one of them reminds me of you. She was a woman whose husband and six children were murdered, and she woke in a pool of her own blood. She miraculously survived. And she said, first she screamed out to God in anger that, she'd been that she had survived. And then she realized there must have been a reason. It couldn't be something as mean as vengeance. So this woman started uh, an adoption service. 